Welcome to the Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we provide you with insights, quotes, references, and help for your Gospel Doctrine class. Welcome back to another episode of the Gospel Doctrine Helps class. Today, we have a special episode for you. We're looking at uh, lesson number 20 of the Old Testament, which is about the book of Ruth. And most of you are probably very familiar with Ruth and the story that's in Ruth. It is a great story. And the best thing about Ruth is that it's a whopping four chapters. You can actually read the entire book of Ruth during your Gospel Doctrine class. I'm not sure if you want to do that, but it's definitely an option available to you if you want to do that. If you were to do that, I would literally assign out people to read a verse. Depending on how big or how small your ver your class is, you may want to have members of the class read one or two verses, or maybe an entire section, four or five, completely up to you. But it's a story that's great. It has a lot of meaning. It took place in the 12th century. It uh, is during the time of the judges, so the lesson you had last week you can reference. This is during the time where there's apostasy and then people coming back to the Lord. It's also a time in which there was famine in the land. And so um, let's pick up the scriptures and let's read it. Um, if you go to the book of uh, Ruth, it's on page 377 in my Bible. And uh, what I would do is I would just start out and read verses 1 through 5 and then talk about them. I'm just going to, for brevity's sake, just reference um, verse 2, chapter 1. It says, In the name of the man was Eli Melech and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephraimites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now, Bethlehem is referenced also in Genesis 35, 19. I would bring that up. And I would talk about why they went to Moab. I would talk about that a, fa a famine being in the land and how they needed to relocate. And it's important to read these first few verses because it gives a history. So, for example, in verse 3, And Eli Melech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So it's important that we understand that she is, Naomi was a widow. Uh, verse 4, And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. So you get about a decade here of her sons, Naomi's sons, with two um, Moab women. And Malon and Chilion died also both of them, and the women was left, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So you got some background story here. And then verses six, I would read verses six through fourteen. Um, that would be the next kind of group cluster that I talk about. But this is very important too because it sets the stage of what's going on. So you have a widow, and sh her two sons have now died. Being barren was an embarrassment in ancient Israel uh, because you wanted to continue on the seed. Also, because they were women, women at this time were not, they didn't have property rights. They couldn't own real estate, couldn't own wealth or farms or anything like that. And so what you have here is a position that uh, not only are they unable to take care of themselves, they're even unable to eat. They don't even have food at this point. And so it, it comes out that, you know, Naomi says to them, hey, Go home, right? I'm picking up in verse 8, right? Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. Right? You you women are, are kind. You're generous. You know, God bless you. Be on your way. And the Lord grant that he may that you may find rest. You know, that's in verse 9. You could talk about what is the rest of the Lord and why is it important to find rest. Right, she kissed them, lifted up their voice, and they wept, right? They cried. And verse 10, they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. So both of her daughters in law said, We're going to come back with you. We're going to return back with you uh, to the children of Israel. And Naomi said, verse 11, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? I mean, I think that's kind of funny, right? Uh, you think I'm, you know, I'm older. I'm not going to have any more kids. There's no more sons in here, right? Be on your way. Go back to your families. Uh, turn again, my daughters, verse 12. Go your way. I am too old to have a husband, if I should say, and I have hope. If I should have a husband also tonight, that I should also bear sons. So, you know, go, right? Get out of here. And um, 
What does it say? It grew with me for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. That's important too in verse 13 to bring that up because Naomi's literally saying that the Lord's hand has gone against her. So she sees the Lord's hand against her as, as maybe being an enemy to her. And a good question to bring out is, do we do this in our own lives? Or how do we do this in our own lives? When we have tragedy befall us, do we say God is behind it? Is he causing the tragedy? Or is it just simply something bad that's happened? Verse 14, And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. So what happens is Orpah, she goes back to her family, and Ruth clave stayed with Naomi. Now the good question is, what, is, what does it mean to clave unto her, right? Verse 15, And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So basically, hey, go back. And it's not just go back to your family, but go back to your, your gods. Um, verse 16 is, is the most profound verse. It's the one that we're all familiar with. We've probably heard repeated. It's probably uh, cross-stitched on several, um, on several pillows, and it's uh, displayed everywhere. It says, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. So this is a great verse to not only read, but to talk about. Because why is it that Ruth was so loyal to Naomi? How loyal should we be to our mothers-in-law, for example? How loyal should we be to God? And uh, she not only forsook her people, she forsook her, her God, her worship. So she essentially left her religion. That's a pretty that's a pretty big and a pretty brave thing to do. So why would you do this? Why put yourself in Ruth's position? Would you ever do this? And why is it important that we follow God and do what God wants us to do? Verse 17 continues. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. I mean you just hear the, the love that uh, Ruth has for Naomi. Uh, where thou diest, I will die. I mean, it's, it's not just, hey, I'm going to live with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there, but I'm going to convert to your religion. And not only that, where you die, I'm going to die too. Verse 18, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. I think if you review those verses, I think Naomi tried to get rid of her at least three times. At least there's three accounts here. Verse 19, so they went, so they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass that they were come to Bethlehem, and all the city was moved about them, and they said, is this Naomi, right? So why is it that her friends, when she comes back to Bethlehem, are questioning her, is this Naomi? It has, it's been, you know, well over a decade, right? Is it because they're not her friends anymore? Is it because she's aged? Is it because... You know, what's happened to her? You, they have pity on her. She's become the town gossip. Something to discuss. Verse 20, And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. See, here you see again Naomi saying, God has dealt bad to me. Bitterly, right? What is bitter? It's the opposite of sweet. And she says that God has done this to her. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. And then, and then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. That's verse 21. So the third time the Lord has um, dealt poorly with her. And she also says that, I mean, the Lord hath testified against me. I mean, think about that. The Lord testifies, right? When we testify the Lord, we're bearing witness that the Lord loves us, that he cares for us. And here she's basically saying the opposite. The Lord has testified against her. Not for her, not in her favor, but against her. Uh, that's, that's not great, right? She's obviously struggling. She said she went, when she went away from the home, she was full, and now she's come back empty. It's almost as if she's that uh, the prodigal son, right? That's kind of the idea that I get, and you might want to reference that. Uh, verse 22, saying, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. So um, something to consider. It's the beginning of the barley harvest, so April, May. Um, it's, it's interesting to note here that 
Do you think, and it's something to ask your class, Naomi viewed Ruth as a burden or as a blessing? Was Ruth an asset to her or was she maybe very negative and didn't want Ruth to be there? Some, something to think about. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Eli Melech, and his name was Boaz. Okay, so we got Boaz. He's a mighty man. He's a kinsman. Okay, so that's important to note. And his name was Boaz. Um, there's reference here to 1 Kings 7.21 if you want to go there. Since we're talking about the barley harvest, it's important at some point you reference Leviticus 19, verse 9 and 10. Uh, and the reason for this is because this is the law that governed the harvest, especially since Naomi and Ruth were poor. So I'm going to switch over to Leviticus 19. I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou garner the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So we have a commandment here to not use, to, to essentially cut corners, right? So that that extra, the gleanings, can be used for the poor. It's almost, a, it's almost a program that was put out by the Lord in order to take care of those poor and needy. Uh, you can also bring this up. How do we care for our poor and needy today? What is it that we should be doing to care for our poor and needy? And you can bring up fast offerings and other programs. Um, those types of things you can ask that question so here we go we have at some point um i'm going to pick it up in verse 11 of chapter 2 and boaz answered and said unto her it hath been fully shown me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and thou art come to a people which thou knewest not heretofore so boaz notices ruth notices what ruth has done because I think, and you could correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, but I think Ruth's taking care of Naomi. I think that's what's going on here. Verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. You see a blessing here from Boaz. Boaz is literally giving uh, Ruth a blessing for what she's doing. Recompense thee for thy work. That recompense sometimes comes in this life, Sometimes does not come until the life to come. Verse 13, Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. You see, what she does is she recognizes that she's a servant. That's uh, the female version of servant in the scriptures is handmaid. And she says, Thou hast comforted me. I have a reference here to teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 149 to 151, if you want to look there about the word comfort and what comfort means. And now let's read verses 14 through 50. Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. You see, Boaz is showing her immense kindness. Immense kindness. He's not only giving her meals to eat, but he's telling his servants, the young men, hey, you know what? Let her take of the sheaves also. Not just that part, but give her plenty of barley to eat. Um, and, and anyway, the, it, verse 17, it says, and it was about an effet of barley that she took. And that's about a three-quarter bushel. Let's keep going. Verse 19, and her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today, and where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And you see here, we see the connections start to go, where she realizes that she's a kinsman. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabitess said, He said unto me, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So she's living with Naomi, 
and they're taking advantage of this situation because they have nothing. They're destitute and they're poor. Great opportunities to talk about how if you are wealthy, you should be serving others. You can even go to King Benjamin's discourse where he talks about uh, not turning away the beggars if we have in order to provide. If we have not, we should be saying to ourselves, if I had, I would give. But because I don't, I, I don't have, I can't give. And now we're going to jump to chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? A uh, good question to ask uh, your class is, what does it mean to seek rest for thee? What is the rest that she's talking about? Verse 2, And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whom maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. And we keep going on, and I'm going to skip over some verses here. You should go over all of them because there's plenty of time, but down to verses 8 through 11 of Ruth, chapter 3. I'm going to touch on these. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter. For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. So again, um, things to consider. Thou art, blessed be thou of the Lord. We have here Boaz pronouncing a blessing upon Ruth again. Blessed be. Uh, reference to uh, Enos, chapter 1, verse 5, where Enos is declared to be blessed by the Lord. Um, we've talked earlier in a different episode about blessed being a named title that you receive once you're blessed by someone, hopefully by the Lord. And then all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. That's a reputation that Ruth had there. How do we acquire the reputation of being virtuous? What must we do in our life as we live so that we can be virtuous. Um, more things happen. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, they tie up by by, Mar by Boaz marrying Ruth. They tie in the lines of Lot and Abraham genealogically. And you can see that in verses 1 through 12. This is a marriage that unites those bloodlines. Um, verse 16, who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all the man had done to her. Right? And she said, these six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. You see, he's generous. He's kind. And this loving kindness is a theme in this, in these four chapters. It's the theme that represents our Lord and Savior. He is loving and kind to us. And he asks that we be loving and kind to others. So one thing you can ask is, how was Ruth loving? And how was she kind to not only Naomi, but also to Boaz? And how were they, there was an intertwine or an interplay of love towards all of them. Uh, moving over to chapter 4, verse 8. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee, so he drew off his shoe. Well, that's interesting. Why in the world would he draw off his shoe? That's something for you to investigate on your own. It's a question you can ask your class. Is it a sign? Is it a token or an oath? Perhaps. Verse 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren. And from the gate of this place, ye are witnesses this day. So what happens here, of course, is Boaz accomplishes something that, that is essential for Naomi. It's allowing the line, the lineal descendants, to continue. By marrying her and having children, which they talk about in verse uh, 17 and then 18 through 22 of chapter 4 gives the lineage all the way to David. So if Ruth and Boaz are the, what is it, great, 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 great grandparents of David who would become king, uh, through whose lineage Jesus Christ would ultimately come. That's something to bring out something to ask your class about, why that's important, and perhaps why this story is contained in our, our Bible. But I want to read through verses 16, or sorry, 13 through 17. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, 
And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child, and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto it. And the woman her neighbors gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So here we have the genealogy, but something to ask your class, for the daughter-in-law which loveth thee. So here we go, another reference to Ruth's love for Naomi. How can we love like Ruth loved? How can we use this as an example in our lives for us to love others better? Which is better to thee than seven sons? So why seven sons? Well, we know that seven is a symbol of perfection. Christ has seven wounds in his body. Seven is complete perfection. Um, that is probably why it says seven sons. Sons were valued more than women back in that time. Um, okay, verse 17, there is a son born to Naomi. Why does it say there is a son born to Naomi when it was actually born to Ruth and Boaz? Because her lineage continues on, right? It's as if she had her own son. So what relation is Ruth to King David? Something to ask your class. Well, I've skipped over quite a bit of things. Like I said, you would be well served to read every verse in this chapter and to talk about them. I didn't get to the section about um, how the near kinsman works. You can definitely do that if you'd like in your class. If you've enjoyed this episode or have questions or concerns or would like episodes on certain specific topics, please leave a, a comment in the box below. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for watching. So after having someone review this video, they mentioned to me that it'd be a really good idea to list why Ruth and explain why in the story of Ruth does the near first near kinsman uh, throw down his shoe? Why is that a sign? Why is that important? Uh, outlined in Ruth chapter 4 verses 1 through 12. Well, it's important that we understand the history and, and you need to go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 25, read verses 5 through 10. It says, If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no children, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed him in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up unto the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face, and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. So what we have here is obviously a near kinsman unto uh, Naomi that is not willing to uh, take on his land, Naomi's uh, husband's land, because of Ruth, Ruth being a Moabite. And here we have some ethnicity or race or prejudice going on here because if you'll remember, the Moabites and the Israelites were not to mix blood. In fact, it was prohibited. And so what you have here is once the, uh, in, in Ruth chapter four, verses one through 12, once you have that kinsman who realizes he's going to have to marry Ruth and doesn't want to, he disclaims it by taking off his shoe. Now it doesn't talk about him, you know, being spat at or anything like that, but that's what happens. That's why he takes off his shoe. And that's why Boaz, who's obviously in love with Ruth, according to the story, uh, then is willing to not only marry Ruth to raise up seed unto Naomi, which is why at the end of the chapter, they say that uh, the child is Naomi's son rather than Ruth's son. 
Um, anyway, I thought I would uh, explain that to you, and that's why I've added this addition here uh, to the end. If you have other comments, suggestions, questions, um, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Thanks for watching.